Let's talk about receptors. So if you remember, res membrane receptor is one of the jobs that membrane proteins can do. We kind of sketch those looking like this, where if this is outside and this is inside the cell membrane, a receptor is some kind of membrane protein that will cause something to happen in here, some sort of change, in response to a stimulus out here. Something happens, usually a molecule binds to this, but it's not strictly limited to that. And that causes some kind of change here inside the cell. Now, it's worth noting, this lets the in machinery inside the cell know that the stimulus is out there, but whatever this is doesn't have to actually enter the cell. So one example we used was for was of the a molecule called the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. This is a gated, specifically a chemically gated, sodium channel. Technically, it allows sodium and potassium to pass, but for reasons we're not going to get into right now, mostly it, work, mostly it matters that it's a sodium channel. So let's draw on its gate, and it's chemically gated by a site here outside the cell. The way this works is that when the molecule acetylcholine, usually just abbreviated ACH, when the molecule acetylcholine binds to this protein, it causes the gate to open and allows sodium to flow through. In most cases, we'll get to why later, that means sodium is going to flow into the cell which is going to cause a change in here. There's sodium coming in that causes a number of things to happen. So this protein allows the inside of the cell to know when acetylcholine is present outside the cell. But notice the acetylcholine does not go into the cell. The acetylcholine is the signal, but what happens inside the cell is not acetylcholine actually entering. Because of that, we, when we talk about receptors, we usually talk about the concept of transduction. Transduction is the is responding. Actually, I'm not going to say responding. I'm going to say changing signal from one form to another. So here. Outside the cell, the signal is the presence of the molecule acetylcholine. Inside the cell, the signal is a change in sodium concentration and possibly membrane potential, which we'll get to. Don't worry about that yet. So we, this protein has transduced a signal. Acetylcholine, presence of more sodium inside the cell. Different signal, but it still allows the inside of the cell to respond. If you think back to our castle analogy, when the guard on the wall goes, Barbarians! They've changed the signal of ice, the visual sight of barbarians to sound a set of pressure waves that carry information to the people inside the castle. When those pressure waves hit their ears, their brain translates that as the word barbarians. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. In general, that's the job of a receptor. It's a transducer. In a way, it's the kind of sense organ that cells have. If you think of the inside of the cell as needing to sense the outside world, receptors are what lets it do that. It causes some sort of change inside the cell in response to the presence of something outside the cell. When we get to the nervous system, we'll talk about human senses and how they kind of do the same thing, which is going to bring up some really interesting ideas about what's going on inside your brain. But that's one of my favorite things in the whole course. We'll get to that. Anyway, let's talk about some specific kinds of receptors. So, when we talk about receptors, there's kind of two broad categories that, in which they can work. I'm going to start with one, which is the idea of a receptor channel. 
You've already seen one. That nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is a receptor channel. A receptor channel is an ion channel that is gated by the presence of some ligand outside the cell. In other words, it's just a chemically gated ion channel. Specifically, one in which the ligand binds outside the cell. So we have a ligand, whatever it is that it binds to it, that causes the channel to open. Or in a few cases, that's what makes it close, but most usually it's what makes it open. So receptor channels work quickly, fast, and usually short duration responses. The ligand binds, channel opens. Ligand comes off, channel closes. So we get a quick response that usually doesn't last all that long, usually. And the thing we get is a change in ion concentrations, which often leads to a change in membrane potential, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will. Now what that does, well that depends. Uh, for example, in cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle has calcium channels on its surface that responds to the binding of certain hormones. And when that calcium comes in, it affects the functioning of the machinery in the heart muscle. In other cases, like in nerve cells, usually what matters is that it's causing a change in membrane potential, but not always. So there are some subtleties there, but that's just the general idea. Receptor channel is pretty simple. In the nervous system, so you know it, these are also sometimes called ionotropic receptors. That's a term we use in the nervous system, ionotropic receptors, so you know. All right, now, the other general group of receptors that I'm gonna talk about are ones that use what are called second messengers. So the idea of a second messenger, and this is a general idea, I'm not applying this to any specific receptor at this point, is that we're going to have a receptor here in the cell. So this is outside the cell. The idea of a second messenger is that whatever we're responding to, usually some sort of ligand, binds to the receptor. And the receptor makes some other molecule. Usually, many of them. So one of these ligands binds to the receptor and it starts making second messenger molecules. Some sort of new molecule made inside the cell. That molecule, that second messenger, is going to then, usually, that's going to cause some sort of effect inside the cell. Not always, but in many cases, the second messenger is going to regulate some sort of enzyme. So we'll say that these second messengers are probably allosteric regulators for some ends for enzymes inside the cell, which in turn are going to make some other molecule. That's, that sometimes can actually be a third messenger. You can have multiple steps here. Or this could be something that does something more directly. But this is one common way that this works. One ligand molecule binds to one receptor, which makes a bunch of second messengers. Often, those act as regulators for enzymes inside the cell, but each make a bunch of third messengers. And what you get is this big amplification. One ligand molecule ended up causing the production of a lot of other signal molecules inside the cell. We sometimes refer to this whole process 
has a cascade or a second messenger cascade where a little bit of signal here causes a lot of signal here through this multi-step process of regulating things inside the cell. So that's the general concept of a second messenger. Now, sometimes people say, well, isn't this a second messenger too? You bind, this opens, ions come in. So the ion is a second messenger, right? Not exactly. A second messenger is a new molecule made inside the cell. Not something that came from outside, but something new in here. Here, the sodium's coming in. That's not really a second messenger. Although it's not impossible for the ion that comes in to regulate enzymes in the cell. So in some ways it's a little like it, but we don't think of it as a second messenger, at least not usually. Not for the purposes of this class in any case. So what I'm going to do is now talk about a couple of specific versions of second messengers. And actually kind of two general groups of those. Some of these markers don't erase very well. Okay. All right. So in our conceptual tree, we had receptors, and those came in receptor channels and receptors that use second messengers, second messenger based. That's what we just talked about. And now we're going to talk about two versions of those receptor enzymes and G protein coupled receptors. So first let's talk about receptor enzymes. These are relatively straightforward. A receptor enzyme is really just a membrane enzyme whose active site is on the inside of the cell that has a regulatory site on the outside of the cell. So our ligand binds to the receptor, causing a change at the active site, which changes whether that active site is working. That active site is going to make some sort of second messenger. So really, this is just an enzyme that makes a second messenger, which is regulated by a ligand outside the cell. But that is what makes this act as a receptor. Presence of ligand causes change in the amount of second messenger. Often, this turns on the enzyme, but not always. Sometimes the enzyme is usually making the second messenger, and the ligand turns it off, in which case the signal inside the cell is the absence of the second messenger. But that's just as good. If someone turns off the light in the room, that can carry just as much information as if the light turns on. So I hope you get that idea. Now, there's a few specifics about this. Receptor enzymes are usually either guanylyl, guanylyl cyclase. Notice the ACE, that says it's an enzyme. So the receptor enzyme is often a guanylyl cyclase whose job it is to turn a molecule called GTP, which is very much like ATP, it's just instead of adenosine triphosphate, it's guanosine triphosphate, into something called CGMP, which stands for cyclic guanosine monophosphate. That is the second messenger in this case. We've just got GTP sitting around inside the cell, and when the enzyme is active, it turns some of that GTP into CGMP. And then CGMP usually regulates other stuff inside the cell, maybe other enzymes. The other thing that it's fairly common that you'd find here, rather than being a guanylyl cyclase, it can also be a protein kinase. Kinases are enzymes which add phosphates to other things. So a protein kinase will add phosphate 
to other things, usually other proteins. Usually what's going on there is that this protein kinase, when it, if this is a protein kinase, when its ligand binds, it becomes active and it starts adding phosphates to other proteins, usually enzymes. Those phosphates act as regulators for those enzymes. So what you might imagine is if this is a protein kinase, I'm sitting here and when my ligand binds to me, I start going, you stick a phosphate on there. And now this enzyme is active and it starts doing something. You enzyme, stick a phosphate on there. And now you're active and you start going doing something. In that case, the second messenger is the phosphorylated enzyme that I made in the cell. And that then is going to start doing something else in the cell. So these are two common versions of membrane enzymes. One allele cyclases, which turns GTP into, C into CGMP, that's the second messenger there, and protein kinases, which phosphorylate other proteins, often enzymes, inside the cell. So this is one second messenger kind of um, receptor. The other one is a little more complicated. And during this class, when I say a little more complicated, your response should be, oh, goody! Because a little more complicated usually means more interesting. That's the thing. Physiology is not simple. There's always complexity. There's always something more subtle. You'll never learn all of it. I certainly don't know all of it. I don't, know a tiny, I don't even know a tiny fraction of it. But that's a good thing. It means there's always something more interesting just below the surface of what you're learning. It also means that in order to teach this stuff, I'm always kind of lying to you because I'm always simplifying it. Often because I don't know the next more complicated step. But even when I do, I'm intentionally simplifying it. So that does mean that sometimes I'm saying things which aren't strictly true. I'll try to let you know when I'm lying most egregiously or knowingly. Anyway, so receptor enzymes are one kind of second messenger using receptor. The other kind are G-protein coupled receptors. So let's see how those work. So a G-protein coupled receptor is a little more complicated. I'll draw one common way that they're arranged here. Really, a G-protein coupled receptor is not just one protein. It's kind of a whole complex, a machine. So this part here is going to be the receptor itself. Over here is going to be something controlled by that receptor. In this case, an enzyme. And this thing in red here is a G protein, a little, a small protein attached to this. Specifically, it's what we call a subunit of a G protein that's going to be released. So what happens is we have our ligand. That ligand binds to the receptor. When the ligand binds to the receptor, the receptor releases the G protein, which goes and binds to something nearby, in this case, an enzyme. That is now acting as a regulator for the enzyme. So the enzyme is now going to make some sort of second messenger. It's a, it's a lot like a receptor enzyme, except it's a two-stage process. This, this is the receptor, and it then regulates the enzyme, rather than with the membrane enzyme where it is regulated by the ligand. Here, the ligand affects the receptor, which releases the G protein, which regulates the enzyme. Now, as to what kind of enzyme this is and what second messenger it produces, again, there's a couple of possibilities. One common one, this enzyme can be an adenylyl cyclase which turns ATP into cyclic AMP. This is a lot like the guanylyl cyclase. It just uses a slightly different nucleotide. So it turns adenosine triphosphate into cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And CAMP then is the second messenger. 
So this is the enzyme, that's the second messenger. So this would be the adenylyl cyclase, this would be the cyclic AMP. Another option is the enzyme can be something called phospholipase C, often abbreviated PLC. What phospholipase C does is turn phospholipids into actually two different second messengers. One called DAG, which stands for diacylglycerol, if you really want to know. The other is IP3, which stands for inositol triphosphate, if you really want to know. These can have different effects. Um, IP3 usually affects calcium channels inside the cell. You'll see a few examples of that later on. So in this case, this would be phospholipase C, this enzyme. And the second messengers would be DAG and IP3. So those are two common enzymes that are associated with uh, G-protein coupled receptors. Now, a couple last things about G-protein coupled receptors. In the nervous system, these are sometimes called metabotropic receptors when you see them in the nervous system. These are also, G-protein coupled receptors are also the most common kind of receptor. All sorts of things use G-protein coupled receptor systems. And I'll point them out as we go through, as, through a whole class. You'll see them multiple times. All right. Now that's about all I wanted to cover on receptors. So we talked about receptors in general do the job of transduction. We have receptor channels, which are just chemically gated ion channels. And then we have ones that use second messengers, receptor enzymes, where the receptor is an enzyme that's regulated by the ligand and G-protein coupled receptors, where the receptor is controlled by the ligand and what it does is release a G-protein, which then regulates an enzyme. Or in some cases, this could actually be an ion channel regulated by the G-protein. Um, not very often, but that does happen sometimes. Now, one last thing here. We mentioned how the responses of receptor channels are short and fast. The responses of second messenger-based receptors are usually slower and longer lasting. Um, that can, they can take fra anywhere from fractions of a second to seconds to, to seconds to take effect. And they can last seconds, minutes, hours, even longer. So these are for very short, quick responses. These are for longer lasting responses. All right, now, the other part of that's leaving that aside for a bit, now that we know about how cells respond to signals, let's talk briefly about some of the kinds of signals cells might send to each other, the concept of cell communication. Remember, you are not a single-celled organism. Your body is composed of literally trillions of cells. And these cells have to be able to talk to each other in order to coordinate the functioning over this large organism, this cellular spaceship that is you. Sometimes that means talking to cells right next to them. Sometimes it means talking to cells all the way over on the other side of the body. Sometimes they know exactly who they want to talk to. And sometimes they just have a message to send out to everybody. All of those are different communication methods. So let's go over some of those. So this is cell communication. Now, we can talk about several kinds of cell communication. Let's start by talking about short range, where we're talking about communication between cells that are very close to each other, no more than a couple cells away. There's several versions of this. And we're going to start with the ones that are the most close, the kind of most intimate in a way, and go into the ones that are, that are a little bit further apart. So. The closest kind of communication that two cells can easily have is being joined by what we call gap junctions. When two cells are joined by gap junctions, what you have is one cell that puts out a special kind of channel protein, and then another cell puts out the same kind of channel protein, and those two cells actually link channels. These cells have to be touching. The proteins have to be in physical contact because they then join 
and form a bridge from one cell to the other. And then materials can flow between these cells, water, ions, even some small organic molecules. So in some ways, these two cells aren't even really completely separate cells anymore. They're joined in a way that lets them share some molecules directly. When I talk about cell communication, sometimes I try to liken it to the ways that humans communicate with each other. But that's a little difficult on this one. This would be like communicating with someone by going up and shaking their hand, and when your hands touch, you grow blood vessels between you, and blood flows back and forth between the two of you. So you share actual cells, which is not something that humans do. Now, I do remember one class I said, there just aren't any forms of communication where humans share fluids like that. And then I realized that is not strictly true, but I'm not going to take that analogy any farther right now. So, this is kind of the most direct form of communication. You see this uh, between smooth muscle and cardiac muscle cells, and in some cases between neurons. So, a slightly less direct form of communication is what we call contact-dependent signaling. This is still a form of communication where the two cells have to be in direct contact. But in this case, the two cells have membrane proteins which act as receptors for each other. So the ligand for this receptor is this protein, and the ligand for that receptor is that protein. So that when these two cells come in contact, each cell gets a signal that it has found the thing that matches that cell surface protein. This is a very common way that cells communicate that involves them actually coming into physical contact. Um, one example of this is if you've got white blood cells that are sort of, the, some kinds of white bloods creep around and actually physically touch other cells, what they're doing is kind of touching that cell and looking for things that match certain receptors on their surface. And if they find it, it tells that white blood cell, I need to respond to this in some way. So for example, the, one of the ways that our cells indicate that they are part of us, my cells have to say, I am part of Dr. Rad when they encounter my immune cells. And the way they do that is by having a cell surface protein called an MHC, a major histocompatibility complex, that acts as a little ID tag. It says, I am a Dr. Rad cell. That ID tag is effectively unique to me so that my immune cells know that anything that has that tag is part of my body. And anything that has an ID tag that isn't like that one doesn't belong here. And that can trigger the immune system to respond to that thing. Which is, for example, if you put an organ in my body, my immune cells may reject it. They may attack it saying, ah, this is not us. Kill it, kill it. Uh, People who work on transplants are always looking for ways to modulate that response so that we don't reject things that we want to be in there. And there's all sorts of subtleties to that. It's a really interesting thing to go into. And it's, it works for other things too. If you're in embryology, if you're a developing embryo, as the cells are moving around, they kind of have to know who they're next to. A cell might say, I'm a kidney cell. What are you? You're a brain cell. No, I don't want to be. Ah, you're going to be a kidney cell. We should stick together. Things like that. All right. Now, Still in short range, but not depending on the two cells actually touching, we have paracrine signaling. In paracrine signaling, one cell will have little membrane bubbles full of some sort of chemical and it can release that chemical into the environment around it, into the extracellular fluid immediately around that cell. And then any cell in the immediate area that has receptors for that chemical can respond. So when this cell releases a little red dot chemical, these two cells have receptors for it. So they get the signal up. Somebody just released little red dot chemical. Maybe that means I should do such and such. Uh, an example of this is in the kidney, where a cell which is responsible for detecting the amount of flow through a certain tubule releases a, a different releases paracrine messengers when that flow changes in certain ways, and then other cells nearby know that when I detect that chemical, I should respond in this particular way, which helps the kidney work properly. 
Um, so if this one was shaking hands and having blood vessels grow between you, this one might be feeling for someone whose nose you recognize. Going, let's see, is this... Uh, no, that doesn't feel like the right nose. Uh, oh, I know that nose. You're my friend um, Baruch or something. This, the closest analogy I could come up with, is um, farting in an elevator. So you're in the elevator and you go, somebody has released hydrogen sulfide. And you know that you may want to respond to that in some way. Or not. It's kind of impolite, usually. But anyway. Now, there's a special case for this where sometimes the cell that released the chemical has receptors for it. So that when that chemical shows up, sometimes it actually causes a response in the cell that released the chemical. That's a special case here called autocrine signaling, where the cell that releases the chemical also has receptors for the chemical, which doesn't make a lot of sense for us, because usually we know when we send off a signal. But remember, cells are machines. They don't necessarily know anything. And sometimes it makes the most sense for all the cells in the area to know, when I detect red dot chemical, I should do so and so. And then if one of them releases it, they all get the signal, so they all respond. It makes sense. Okay, those are the short range chemical signaling. Gap junctions, contact dependent, and paracrine, and the special case for paracrine, autocrine signaling. Now, Let's talk about long range. These will only work, even in the case of paracrine, this only works in as far as this molecule can diffuse. And that's usually only a few cells away, le much less than a millimeter distance. What about when cells need to communicate with something further away? Well, there's really two methods for that. One of them, is endocrine signaling. In endocrine signaling, again, we're going to have a case where a cell has bubbles with some sort of messenger molecule. And it's releasing them. But in this case, what it's releasing them into is the bloodstream. So now I release that messenger molecule into the blood, and it goes everywhere throughout the entire body. And elsewhere in the body, we can have cells that have receptors for that message. And when that message binds, they know to respond to it. Now, there's some interesting things about this. Number one, this cell releasing the chemical doesn't know or have to know who it's talking to. This cell, all it has to know is, it's time to release my message. So for example, uh, there are cells in the uh, anterior pituitary that release a chemical message called uh, follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. They don't know where that's going. They don't know who's going to hear it. They just know that under these conditions, I release FSH. And it goes into the blood, and every cell in the body has the option to receive it. So any cells out there that have receptors for FSH will receive that message and may respond in some way. In the case of FSH, that usually affects the gonads. And it affects the menstrual cycle, and it can affect sperm production in men. But this cell doesn't need to, this cell here in the anterior pituitary doesn't know that. It just knows time to release FSH, and if one of the kidney cells happens to have receptors, well, it'll respond too. This is kind of like just sending out an email to everybody. Um, this cell doesn't, actually, what it's more like is tweeting. This cell sends the tweet, and it doesn't necessarily know who's following it. It just knows I'm putting out this message, and anyone who wants to listen can hear it. So, Endocrine messages, which we call hormones, by the way, we'll talk about that later in the course, go through the whole bloodstream and any cell in the body can hear it. Any cell that puts out receptors can respond to that hormone. So that's one kind. Endocrine signaling can go anywhere, but it's relatively slow. It takes minutes for a chemical message to circulate through the entire bloodstream. So if my anterior pituitary puts out FSH, other cells in my body 
will receive that anywhere from seconds to minutes later. Now, what effect it has and how long that lasts, totally different question. But it's broadcast and relatively slow. The other kind of messaging is neurocrine. So this is broadcast and slow. Neurocrine is targeted and very fast. In neurocrine signaling, a cell sends a message to specific other cells in the body. It can be more than one, it can be even thousands, but it is specifically chosen because the cell sending the signal has to have a physical extension that actually goes to those other cells. So the idea would be this. If this cell here wants to talk to these three cells, this cell has to have already made a physical growth that goes out very close to those three cells. And when this cell decides it's going to send a signal, it does a really cool thing, which we're going to talk about in more detail than you would ever want, probably, in the next unit of this class. It, it's a combination of electrical and chemical signal that travels down this growth extension and out to all of the ends of it. When it gets to the ends, it causes the release of a very short range chemical transmission that these cells will have receptors for. So those three cells get that message. Now, this signal, this electrical chemical signal, moves very fast. It depends on, how fast depends on the cell, but it can move in excess of 100 miles per hour. So the transmission speed here over the size of the human body is pretty short. Most of the time we don't really pay attention to how long it takes the signal to get where it's going. But it only goes to the cells that are specifically targeted by this. So this is how nerve cells communicate. When, my, when I decide I want to kick my leg, the muscles here are, I have cells up here in my brain that have a physical connection that comes down, actually cells here in my spine, here in my spine, that have a physical connection that comes out to the muscle cells here. When this cell gets a signal from the brain, it sends an electrochemical signal down a nerve, and that nerve is just a bundle of these transmission cables there and causes a very short range chemical release onto those muscle cells. They have receptors for it and they respond by contracting. So I go kick like that. But it's only to those, it's only to very specific muscle cells. In fact, this can be so specific that it goes to a particular part of a target cell. This isn't just like saying, I'm going to talk to Bob. This is saying, I'm going to talk to the underside of Bob's pinky so that the rest of Bob's body does not see it. I'm sitting here whispering to Bob's pinky. It can be that targeted, and sometimes it matters that it's that targeted. It's fast and very specific, and it can't, eat, can't be changed quickly. If I want to change who gets the target of this, of this message, any cell that wants to can put out a receptor and receive that hormone. But if this cell wants to send a signal to other cells, it's going to have to grow that. And that does not happen easily. There's some debate about how, well, how much it happens at all. You can remove connections, and you can change how much signal is released there. But growing new ones is hard. Anyway, so these are two kinds of long-range signaling. They can communicate over the whole body, but they have different characteristics. Now, one last thing about this one. Sometimes people say, okay, well, isn't that a paracrine signal? It has some in common with a paracrine signal in that it's a release of a chemical into the extracellular fluid that binds to a receptor. However, with paracrine signaling, usually you're releasing the chemical and it goes into the extracellular fluid around the cell and any cell nearby that has a receptor can receive it. This is not just near that cell, it's close enough 
that the distance between this part and the target cell can only really be seen with a very good with a good electron microscope. We're talking, I believe, a couple dozen atomic widths. So extremely close range. That's why it can be so targeted. All right, that's it for cell communication. The last part of this lecture, we're going to be talking, getting into the idea of membrane potential, which is a little bit complicated. So when you're ready, come into that one and just be ready to think big at first, to think about some concepts and some things you probably have never thought about before. Probably. All right, see you soon.